Hello, it's Scott Manley here. I'm currently watching this uh, biconic re-entry capsule descending towards the space center at a great rate of knots and then attempting to break its descent smoothly so that I may land. Now, this is, of course, Kerbal Space Program 2, which just had a big update a couple of weeks ago, fixing a number of bugs. But more importantly, this is a reference to Stoke Space who have been getting some attention for moving very, very quickly and doing a lot of things, well, different. Over the weekend, they flew their first piece of full-scale hardware. This is a small hop by the second stage of their hardware. This is a hydrogen-oxygen rocket with 30 thrusters. It's one engine, but there's 30 nozzles around a ring and a sort of dome-shaped heat shield at the back which does act somewhat like an aerospike. Now, what they're trying to demonstrate here is that they can simply control this vehicle by using differential thrust. That is by very carefully controlling the throttle of each engine. So these are some engine tests that they posted, so, you know, all performed last year. Now, this, this uh, rig was set up with only 15 of the 30 engines. In the middle, you can see the main uh, power head of the engine, right? That is where you have the turbo pumps that are pushing the fuel and the oxidizer around. The thrust chambers around the outside are what's actually generating the thrust. So technically, one engine, 30 nozzles. Why are they doing this? Well, because they want to build a completely reusable rocket and they started out designing their rocket by trying to figure out how they could integrate rocket engine into a heat shield. So, you know, SpaceX demonstrated that booster recovery was possible. Blue Origin's planning to do it. Rocket Lab is planning to do it as well. However, SpaceX have been unable to adapt the second stage of the Falcon 9 to make it recoverable. And a big part of that is because it has this giant nozzle extension to get a, an efficient rocket stage. It's great at converting exhaust gases into Delta V, but it becomes a problem when you're trying to return to the planet with it. Now, this is the concept that SpaceX published you know, some time ago. Problem with this is that the design of the spacecraft, the engines tend to be the heavy part, so it doesn't want to enter head first. It doesn't want to transition. And the truth is, the second stage of the Falcon 9 wasn't designed from day one to be recoverable. But Stoke Space, they have pretty much started with the notion that this is going to be a fully recoverable rocket. And so they started working on the second stage, since the first stage is pretty much a solved problem. So in the handful of years that they have been active in developing hardware, they've really just been building out the second stage concept. It has the heat shield which has uh, 30 small engines around it. They've decided to use liquid hydrogen and oxygen, which I mean, I, I, a lot of the small rocket companies have pretty much stayed away from that because it is uh, problematic. It's more expensive than other alternatives, and it also adds engineering complexity. But it has a lot of technical advantages, including being uh, pound for pound the best coolant for a heat shield, I believe. This heat shield is like the wall of a rocket engine, with hydrogen flowing through it to keep it cool. They actually have a patent on uh, an expander cycle driven by the heat on the heat shield. That is, the re-entry heating on that heat shield heats up the hydrogen, it turns to vapor, that vapor drives a turbine, that turbine drives a pump, and that pump pumps more hydrogen through the system. Makes a lot of sense. And it turns out that that's also the technology that they're using for their engines. They're using expander cycle engines. I have a whole video on that there. Expander cycle is where, again, you use thermal energy to expand a working gas, and then that drives your turbines. Now, the most famous expander cycle engine is the RL-10, which turns up everywhere in American uh, rockets. This one differs from that American workhorse in that it is an expander bleed cycle, which means instead of expanding the gas through the turbines and then feeding that into the engines, they simply dump the stuff that goes through the turbo pumps overboard. And that means that they can get higher chamber pressures, higher thrust from the engine, but they pay a little uh, in terms of performance. I would also imagine that because you don't have this uh, strong coupling between the pump pressures and the chamber pressures, it's much easier to tune the thrust of your engines very rapidly, which is exactly what you want to do with this. 
Another design decision which aids controllability is the decision to use pintel injectors with face shut off. Now I have a whole video on injectors you should watch, but the idea is that the valve that controls the fuel, fuel flow is right inside the combustion chamber so you get very rapid response. Another part of this design is that the heat shield acts as part of the nozzle when they're in a vacuum. In a vacuum, as you know, the rocket exhaust will expand out into the vacuum as quickly as it can. But uh, the gas that expands inwards from the ring of engines forms a high pressure zone on the back of the vehicle and that will push against the heat shield and therefore provide a little more thrust. And this is not a new concept. This is something called a plug nozzle. In fact, this vehicle looks a whole lot like some uh, cool ideas from the 1960s. So in a way, this is an altitude compensating nozzle. It gets decent performance at low altitudes without having to worry about flow separation. And then as the pressure drops, it gets more and more thrust from that heat shield. One important part of the system is that the center of the heat shield is where they dump the exhaust gases. And that is, of course, unburned hydrogen. So when the thing actually is flying, you get this plume of hydrogen like burning dirtily in the atmosphere down the middle. So you can see that in the actual videos. Now, this is, doesn't really matter at this altitude, but once it gets up to higher altitudes, it's really starting to take advantage of this. Another cool thing people noticed about this test is if you look at the plume of condensation coming off the top, it literally appears to evaporate as the engines light up. Now, <laughs> what's actually happening is that plume is because it's hydrogen, liquid hydrogen that has uh, evaporated and that is causing condensation to form in the air. As soon as those engines light, that liquid hydrogen catches fire and of course the heat then removes the condensation from the atmosphere. Hydrogen engines are most efficient when they run fuel rich, so they have lots of unburned hydrogen floating around. And in this test environment, it's totally understandable that they're burning it off. Of course, SpaceX, they're working with methane on Starship, and that means that they have to collect it and either recondense it or in the past they used a flare stack. Now, another really important thing is if you look at the bottom of this, it may not look as if it's quite straight. And that isn't because they couldn't bend metal correctly. They chose stainless steel because they understood how to fabricate it. No, that heat shield is actually intentionally skewed. That small skew on that heat shield means that when the spacecraft is uh, going backwards through the atmosphere at hypersonic speeds, there will be a slight lateral force that will act as a wing. And by rolling the spacecraft, depending on, you know, depending upon their control needs, they can use that lateral force to adjust and trim their target. This isn't a new concept. Pr pretty much every space capsule does this. Now, for the first stage, uh, as we understand, they're going to use liquid methane. I think it looks like they're going to have like uh, either seven or nine engines or basically a ring with a central engine underneath it. And so, of course, I thought it would be great for me to try building this in Kerbal Space Program 2. After all, we've had the new update that fixes a whole bunch of things. And, you know, I sort of built something that looks somewhat approximately good. And it does take off and it does fly. And it has all the capabilities we should need from a booster. So what we know from Stoke is that they are still planning to build their own engines. They want to use methane for the first stage. They want to use a high performance closed cycle. They said they want to do a full flow stage combustion cycle, but if they want to do something simpler like an oxidizer rich stage combustion, they can do that. This is all pretty ambitious, but it's clear that Stoke have moved very rapidly and they have a lot of in-house talent that's been able to build out their uh, second stage engine. My Kerbal version, on the other hand, has had a lot less design uh, work put into it. It has uh, seven vector engines. It has grid fins. Well, sorry, it has air brakes at the top to allow it to descend in reverse and landing legs to let it come back. This is supposed to be recoverable. So we do go through the launch sequence and it'll happily go through the whole stage separation sequence, fire up the plug nozzle. But of course, Kerbal Space Program doesn't actually model the dynamics of rocket exhaust, so it's not getting any of the altitude compensating nozzle effect for this. I don't have an inclined heat shield. But look, definitely possible to build this and take it to orbit. For the landings, however, well, let's say a Kerbal Space Program to early access, it definitely is still very much evident. Uh, you know, you would 
randomly lose thrust from engines, uh, or you would consume way more propellant than you should, you would find uh, the vehicle just descending towards the ground without anything to stop it. And for the second stage, while it could take off and land just like that hopper, the fact that I had to use nice uh, fairings to make the thing look like the real deal, uh, that unfortunately meant that we had a, a very low drag at the front and much higher drag at the back, and that meant the centre of pressure moved further back. And if the centre of pressure is far back, then the thing wants to point forwards into the airstream like it's some sort of... Uh, you know, nuclear weapon re-entry vehicle rather than, say, a rocket that's going to land nicely on its heat shield. Now, 10 years ago, I would have had the time to persevere, the time to figure out the problems either with my designs or with the software and make it happen. But uh, yeah, I actually have a lot of really important things to do, so I'm leaving you with the nearest thing I had to a success. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.